I'll begin with, you know, what is the what, the why, the how, who, and what about DRC. So to give you a little bit more detail about it. Okay, so I think this is very appropriate after Dr. Yu's talk uh, about the mixed realities. And uh, we are entering what's called a, a zettabyte phase. And I showed you these slides last year's winter school, okay? And, uh, you know, it used to be that people would say with technologies, oh, that's going to take 50 years from now or 100 years from now. But in my observations, um, actually, it's kind of fun if we say, if you put the two down here, okay, then it really means seven years. Nobody gets that joke? <laughs> not, this is not 111 years, but it's 111 binary. It's actually seven years. Okay? In other words, some people might see Dr. Yusuf and go, oh, that, that's crazy. That's science fiction things, right? Oh, that's in the movies. But no, I really believe that you know, Dr. Yu and your team, they're going to change the world within the next seven years. And it's appropriate, your project's 10 years. So it makes sense. In my observations, having been at the National Science Foundation, talking with industries and looking to talk at, at the international conferences, I see very disruptive things happening only in seven years. Okay? So, you know, this is a very funny uh, slide. Again, I showed this last year. And you can find it at this website. And it talks about all the different technologies that have gone extinct. Okay? So for example, this one over here, it says getting lost. So about, about 2014, the idea of getting lost will be extinct. And, and that makes some sense. Everybody will have a smartphone and with navigation systems. You know, they'll be able to find themselves anywhere in the world. Okay? So they say, you know, 2019, libraries, you know, copyright, you know, this is inter internal combustion cars, these will go extinct. And I think this is always the one that's kind of funny. In 2050, ugliness and death, that will be extinct. So, you know, in about 30 years, we'll all be very, very handsome, we're very, very pretty, and we won't die. So that's kind of, it's funny, but it's not crazy. So for example, DARPA just set aside $7 million to do Avatar. So like the movie Avatar, already DARPA is investing in the technologies to make that kind of outside embodiment experience possible. Okay? And this one came out in April where they start to talk about this DARPA Robotics Challenge. Still, nobody really knew about it, but about, uh, about April, that's when we started leaking some media about it. So in other words, things that we think are going to be crazy 100 years from now is not really uh, true. I, I think you have to think what's going to happen within the next seven years. And I know this because most of you are PhD students, graduate students. And sometimes you could spend five years, six years doing your PhD dissertation. There's a risk that by the time you graduate, that maybe your technologies are going to go extinct. So this is how I train my PhD students. You have to think much further ahead and to align your research to be in time for that wave of technology. Okay? So I'm hoping hoping that some of the things that I shared with you hope could give you some guidance as to how, when you start working on your, on your dissertations. Okay, so this is the first slide of two. What? What is the DRC? Okay. So in October 24th, this is when DARPA released to the world and they had a big press event. And shortly after, lots of newspapers started to talk about the DRC. And I found out also in Korea, they started to publish some, some articles about it. And this is just some of the headlines trying to describe what is DRC. Okay? 
So, you know, as one professor mentioned, it's about disaster ready robot. Okay? Uh, I mentioned this one. It's a $2 million prize. The winner gets $2 million. Okay? Uh, somebody mentioned humanoid robots. Okay? So some of them mentioned about tools like driving vehicles. For me, like I said, I think all of this, this is details. The reality is DRC is a teaching moment for us. It is a learning moment, and it's a defining moment for our field. I think it will fundamentally change the way we think about design and interact with robots in the next seven years. Okay. Another way of saying it is I think DRC is the biggest show in robotics history. Okay. So what is it? Some more details. Okay, you could go to this website. This is made by DARPA to learn more of the details. And essentially, you get two million dollars as a prize if you make a robot that can do all eight events. And you could read through it, and it's it's pretty crazy. But what makes it even crazier? is that it has to be autonomous. We have about 15 months to do it, actually 12 months now. And you know they provide a little bit of you know, support. Okay? But this is the hardest part, 15 months to make sure your robot can do all eight of these things. So why? Why is this DRC, why, why does DARPA put this together? And it's really motivated because of this uh, tsunami in 2011. Okay? In Fukushima, what we found out was that there were many vehicles and there were a lot of rescue workers, a lot of tools available. Okay? And if in the first few hours of the accident you could turn off these valves or close these switches or connect hoses, then the impact of the disaster would have been much less. But because the radiation was so dangerously high, they could not put people there. So that's, that was the real tragic thing about it. Okay. So a lot of people, especially in Japan, were asking, where were all the robots? Over the last 30 years of Japan's effort in, in, in creating ro robots, why weren't they good enough to just turn off a valve? Turn off switches, connect hoses. Of course, I know it's a technical, some of this is technically hard. But it became a kind of learning moment for us. We did spend so much effort creating robots, and when we needed them the most, where were they? Okay. Some people wonder what DARPA is. And when I try to explain it to my mother or my grandmother, you know, I say that DARPA, they landed on the moon. This is the agency in the government, in the United States, that put man on the moon. They invented GPS, laser, UAVs, and some say even the internet. Okay? It was founded in 1958 by President Eisenhower in response to Sputnik. Sputnik is when the Russians uh, launched their, their satellite into space. And this surprised the United States. So in response, they created, in 1958, DARPA, with an organization not to be surprised technologically. It is a very, very small government organization compared to the other ones in the United States. It's only about 100 people. And they say it's like a hundred geniuses connected by a travel agent. In other words, they travel all over the world looking for the best technologies, and they come up with ideas. But the most exciting thing about DARPA is it's not a money problem. To them, money is never the problem. It's idea problem. So they're willing to spend millions, hundreds of million dollars developing things like UAVs, GPS, stealth bomber, to make these things happen. Okay, 
But many people think, ah, oh, it's just all about military. Yes, of course. DARPA is about defense. That's the D. Okay? But one of the core missions of the U.S. military is humanitarian assistance and disaster response. That is why in, in Fukushima, many American soldiers were there to provide assistance. They were there at Katrina during the hurricanes. They were there uh, in Haiti during the earthquakes. So this is a very important, HADER, H-A-D-R, is a very important element of the military. It's not just about guns and fighting all the time. Okay, so why a $2 million prize? Okay. Well, Grand Chow, first of all, it comes under the White House. Okay, the White House actually has uh, a program just dedicated to creating grand challenges. And the idea is to increase awareness, not just in universities and labs, but the entire public, to catalyze the development. These are kind of four defining things uh, of a grand challenge. Okay. It has to be very specific, and there has to be a significant bottleneck or barrier. It stands in the way of solving a global problem. Okay, So, for example, disaster response. It is difficult, but not impossible. Okay. And if it's solved, it's going to have global impact. So these are the four things about, about Grand Challenges. Now, Grand Challenge is not a new idea. Okay? These are some examples. It goes as far back as 1714. Okay? Back then, the British government, okay, it was 20,000 pounds, wanted the ships, the ships on the ocean. They knew how to do lateral coordinates, but they did not have longitude. Napoleon in 1795 was worried about food preservation. You know, the army needed lots of food. And so they awarded, you know, 12,000 francs for the idea of canned food. More recently, we see that in the oil cleanup, there was a $1 million prize offered in 2010. Some of you might know about the more recent DARPA Grand Challenges. This one was a, an autonomous vehicle, a car, that went through the desert. And this was the one that went through the city. Okay, so these are nice and, and people get money for this. But you have to see that the impact. Okay? In less than seven years, in the United States, we have Nevada, California, and Florida have legalized driverless cars because of these successes. And some of the very high-end luxury cars from BMW and Mercedes, they have taken the IP, intellectual properties, from this and are putting them as options in the cars. Less than seven years. I remember I was, you know, I was a, a very junior professor at the time looking at these challenges. And, you know, I was a little, said, oh, you yeah, know, that's fun, you know, what's the big deal? But I didn't realize the, the impact it would have. Okay, so now you know the what, you know the why. So how is DARPA doing this challenge? Okay, the how. So if you can see here, there are four tracks, A, B, C, and D. Fundamentally, it's divided by hardware and software. Those that get money, those that don't get money. That's the simple way of thinking about it. Okay? So for example, track A, they have to design the robot and the software, and they get $3 million from DARPA to try to do it. Track D, they also have to do hardware and software, but they get $0. So why, who, would want it, you know, who wants to do it if you don't get any money? There are some companies that, because of intellectual property concerns, 
rather not have any money from power. Okay? So that's one, one reason. Track B gets much smaller money, but they have to develop all the algorithms. And again, track C is the same thing, software, but they get no money from power. Again, for intellectual property reasons. Okay. So this is the schedule that at this time, okay, and I'll tell you the schedule a little bit later, but this time they're going to have a virtual challenge. Okay. These two software teams will compete, and the very best teams will get this robot. They get a robot for free, or as a reward. Okay. So top six performers of track B and C, they get a Boston Dynamics robot. Then, a little bit later, this team with the Boston Dynamics Robot plus these teams from Track A and these teams from Track B will compete in those eight events. Then, I think six teams will allow to continue. They'll be given extra money. And then they finally have the finals where they will get the $2 million prize. So that's, that's kind of the, the mechanics of how they're going to do it. Okay, a little bit more details about the simulation track. Okay? Uh, the simulator is a GFE. We call it the government. The government provides the simulator. It is essentially gazebo okay? with uh, the Boston Dynamic robot modeled into it. Okay? It is open source. Uh, Twelve uh, teams were selected by DARPA and they got the $375,000. Okay. Uh, the track C, which is open to everybody, uh, recently uh, closed. I think there were over 100 track C teams around the world uh, that registered. They have a qualifying round in May and the actual virtual competition um, in June. Now the virtual competition, they only have to do three events, not eight all in software. They have to drive the vehicle, rough terrain walking, post connection. And these are just some of the ways they're going to rank their performance. Okay, so you might see this video. This is the robot that they're going to win, the software teams. Okay. This is essentially the pet men. Okay. You could see that uh, it is, uh, if, you could, if you'll observe closely, it is hydraulically uh, powered. It is uh, dynamic stability. So if you turn off the power, it just it will fall down. It is quite strong. And you can see it kind of going that very narrow uh, crosswalk. So that's essentially the robot that the software teams will get. Okay. A little bit more details. Okay, so six, only six teams will each get this robot. Okay. Uh, it's a near copy of the pet man. You can see that it is, uh, I think it's a little bit under six feet tall. Um, it, it, these are the two hands that will be given with the robot. Uh, one is from uh, Sandia and the other is iRobot. You can notice that it's basically, you know, this is a four-fingered hand, this is a three-fingered one. Okay? Uh, and this is the sensor head that is going to come with the robot. It's essentially a, a bumblebee camera with a Hokuyu uh, LADAR with built-in accelerometers and gyros. So that's, that's what they're getting. Oh, uh, some people should know, because Boston Dynamics is giving the robot they, Boston Dynamics, cannot participate in DRC. Okay. Frank? They get to keep the robot? Yes, they get to keep the robot. And it could be anywhere in the world, except maybe dangerous countries. I don't, I don't think they will give it to North Korea. Or, okay. So this, this is truly an international competition. Okay, so it's kind of fun. Let's, let's find out who were the, the 12 teams that got some funding from DARPA to do software. Okay? So actually with 11, 
Uh, good news, actually there was one joint team from Korea, but you can also see there was one from Israel. So, you know, this is basically a list uh, of the different uh, teams. This is the one I mentioned, KIST. Uh, Kim do is working with the University of Kansas on the software. Okay. Uh, these are some very familiar people in, in the humanoids community. Uh, for example, Seth Teller, Emmanuel Tora, Jerry Pratt. These are people very well known in the humanoids community. So it's not, not too surprising that they got an award. So they each received 375K, and they have to do this virtual react robot challenge in, in, in six months. And if they win, they're going to give it extra money plus a robot. OK, but this is the more fun one, the track game, where you have to do everything, hardware and software, build a robot, program everything. So again, in October, they were given $3 million. Okay. Uh, in about 12 months from now, they have to do the phase one challenge, all eight events. I believe the best uh, four teams uh, will get given an additional million dollars. And then in two years from now, they have the phase two challenge. And the details are not known yet. Okay. Now, originally, DARPA said they were only going to give five teams this money. But because there were so many applications, they decided to increase it to seven teams. Okay. So these were the seven teams. You can see that there are two from NASA, one from Raytheon, which is a very large uh, defense company in the US, uh, CMU, Virginia Tech, and Shaft is a company that spun out of the University of Tokyo. And I'm happy to say, and right, cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> so they, they, we did seven teams. Okay, so a little bit more details. Okay. So this is the first one from CMU by Tony Stentz. Some of you might know Tony. Uh, he is a leader, uh, definitely in the field robotics community. This is the robot that they proposed to DARPA, which they call CHIP, okay? And they call it an intelligent, highly intelligent mobile platform. Okay, so, you know, CMU has a lot of history of grand challenges. They, they know how to do a grand challenge, okay? Uh, essentially, their technical approach is to have very strong arms and legs, okay? Uh, they have a lot of experience with user interfaces. So I think they're going to do more of a teleoperation approach than full autonomy. Okay. And you can see that, of course, uh, Srinivasa and Likachev, these are experts in their fields of dexterous manipulation and uh, you know, whole body motion planning. Okay. So this is essentially their approach. However, most of you might know that CMU does not really have humanoids experience. Uh, they have a lot of experience building these type of vehicles, you know, reconfigurable. They want to take this expertise and try to make this. But currently, they only have 12 months to build a robot. And as far as I know, they only have this drawing. Okay. So uh, there was one NASA team, okay, and they call it Robo Simeon, and some of you might know Brett, Brett Kennedy. Uh, you know, Brett Kennedy uh, helped put the rover on Mars. So they have a lot of experience with robots. Okay, so what they wanted to do is here, they don't care if it's a hand or a leg. To them, it's the same thing. So this is what they're going to design. It's going to be seven degree of freedom limbs, not legs. Everything's a limb. Okay. And they're going to use their computer vision expertise for things called like hazard cams and manipulation cams. Okay. So this, this comes up, but again, JPL, NASA JPL, excellent place. They don't have humanoids experience. They have a lot of field robot experience. And as far as I know, this is just a drawing. They haven't built anything. 
Okay, some people get confused, but there's actually two NASA teams. This is the second one from Johnson Space Center. Johnson Space Center does robot. Okay, so they have some human material. And they really want to use this robotic experience. Uh, they also are looking at exoskeletons. Rob Platt, he was formerly with J uh, Johnson's. He's now a professor at Buffalo. He has excellent grasping experience. And they want to use some new motors that were developed out of Purdue. Okay. However, the question mark here is because they have no robot name and they had no robot picture. So, they just had this thing. So I don't know if they have something or don't have something. Okay. okay. So like I said, Raytheon is a very large uh, company uh, doing defense. And the PI is Tommy Freebie, but they're working closely with USC, Stefan Shaw. Stefan Shaw is definitely a leader in, in the uh, work of learning and uh, humanoids. Uh, they said they have about 20 years experience working with SARCOS, okay, which is essentially a hydraulic torque control robot that's very similar to the PetMan. Okay? Uh, if you look at these uh, different uh, characteristics about the robot, it is very similar to PetMan. The one thing that surprised me from Stefan Schell's talk is that he believes it will be untethered. And I think that's, uh, I find that very hard to believe uh, because the pet man is hydraulic and it is tethered. So I don't know what Stefan has in mind here. But he also has some DARPA experience and I think they, they, they might have something. Okay, again, this is the Sarkos robot. So there might, there, they, there might be something here. Okay, again, this I don't know the name of, okay. and Shaft is a company from University of Tokyo. Okay. Some of you might know the Japanese are very sensitive to receiving money from the military. Okay. So a way around this is that out of this university lab, they created a company. By creating an external company, they were able to receive money from DARPA. Okay. Essentially, this is the PI, Marina Suzuki. Some of you might know that he is a protege of Professor Inaba. Inaba is definitely a world leader in humanoids. Okay? Inaba lab. And essentially, it's HRP2. They have high power hardware technologies, they've demonstrated high stability, they have some very good software. This is the concept drawing that they have. Um, you can see that, uh, you know, that they, they have very, very strong legs. It, it can jump very high. I think uh, what helps is to kind of see a little bit of their video. You can see that you have the HRP kind of driving a vehicle. Well, the, in the DRC, it's going to be a real you know, car. But you can kind of sense they know what's involved. They know how to uh, work with picking up things. Uh, this one, they know how to open doors. They, they have a lot of experience. This is the team I am most scared of. Okay. All right. So uh, the, the other team is from Virginia Tech, and some of you might, of course, you know her. You know Dennis Hong. Uh, oops. Sorry. So essentially, he has partnered up with uh, Dan Lee at the University of Pennsylvania and Robotis, another Korean company. Uh, they have a very interesting approach. I'm a little puzzled by it, but they want to develop two different robots. Okay? One of it is based on the work they did for the Navy, and it uses series elastic actuators. And the second robot is basically based on Charlie, which they used for RoboCup soccer. Okay. 
Uh, they have a lot of experience uh, doing these different uh, darker challenges, and they have good design capabilities. Uh, but this is essentially what they have uh, over here. Okay. okay. And then finally, there's my team. Uh, I call it DRC Hugo. Because Hugo is kind of the, the, the trademark name of the robot and DRC because it's Darpa Robotics Challenge. Okay. So essentially I have in, at Drexel uh, seven Hugos in my lab. Okay. And uh, I partnered up with uh, eight other universities in the US. They will focus mainly on software. And we will leverage uh, expertise at KAIST for the hardware. Collectively, we have over 200 person years with humanoid experience. I think our team has the largest amount of actual humanoid experience, even more so than the Japanese team. Okay. Uh, we have a very interesting strategy. I will talk about that later. But I already have robots that are ready to go. Okay. And you can kind of see, these were all, this is of course not autonomous or anything. We just kind of showed that the body of Hubo could definitely fit inside this vehicle. You know, it, it has enough arm length and leg length to climb a ladder, hold a tool, and turn the valve. So we think Hubo has uh, the potential to do the DRC. Okay, so I told you the who. I did the what, the why, the who. So when and where? So let's talk about this. Okay. So these are the dates. Okay, I told you this is the virtual competition in June. Uh, six teams, they will get a Boston Dynamics robot. In December, we all compete. And then 12 months later, we compete again. All we know is that all events will be outdoors in the daytime, in December. Okay, so it's not going to be where there's snow. So probably somewhere in the south of the United States. I, I hope it'd be Hawaii, but you know, probably it's going to be somewhere like Georgia, Texas, or something like that. Okay? Uh, but DARPA hopes that DRC will continue for many years. And you're thinking about having it in Japan, and Europe, and other places. Okay, so, so just to wrap up, what? What is it? The greatest and most impactful robotics challenge this decade. Definitely this decade. Why? Well, disaster response, I told you this is very important for military and humanitarian assistance. But it's also, it captures the the uh, attention of the public. So who? It was a worldwide participation. And when? Well, in June you'll see the first, first part of it and you'll see the, the rest in December. Okay. The takeaway from today's talk is that DRC is disruptive and transformational. Now, past challenges, if we look at DARPA Urban Challenge, Grand Challenge with the vehicle, it has led to, it, the motivation was that car accidents are mainly a cause because of people. So if we could use robotic technologies to assist people in driving, you could reduce over one million deaths each year in the United States because of car accidents. So it has huge global impact. The DRC will have a very huge, huge impact for humanitarian assistance. And the solutions, if we're successful, it's going to impact manufacturing, agriculture, entertainment, lots and lots of different fields. Intellectual property, I told you, in past challenges, car companies like BMW and Mercedes are making a lot of money doing this. For the DRC, things like sensor heads, perception algorithms, actuators, these are going to be new intellectual properties. They can lead to robot drivers, you know, especially for heavy machines and for manipulation tasks. So if you're really interested in it, you know, please involve, you know, watch the, the robots channels are already participate some more. Okay.
Okay, so that's the end of my first part of the talk. I'd like to take a little break and just answer any questions. Uh, you said the robots have to be uh, autonomous, but you mentioned the CMU team is the final operation? Correct. So the deal is, so the question was, um, I mentioned to be autonomous, but some teams are taking teleoperation approach. You get less points if you do teleoperation. Okay? You get full points if it's autonomous. I can kind of see there are some events you might want to try teleop and pay the price. You'll have less points, but you will succeed in the event. So everybody's just hedging their approach. So the per you know, professor asked the question, what do I find is the biggest challenge uh, for this? Um, I, ask me again in the third part of my talk. I think the general answer is time. Right. I have only a, now about less than 12 months to finish this. Does this work? So excellent question. Uh, Dennis Hong's team, Virginia Tech, showed two robot designs. The DRC rules say that you can only use one robot. Okay, so that's why I question their strategy. Why are they doing both designs? Uh, some people asked if uh, could you have one robot carry another robot. Okay, so for example, ladder climbing. Ladder climbing might be easier with a different type of robot. But the DRC rules say that you have to carry that robot for all eight events. So if you're going to carry it, you're going to have to carry it when you break the door, when you drive the vehicle. So. Which oh. companies are... Competing? Okay. So, for track A, the three million dollar ones, um, the main company is Raytheon. Raytheon uh, is like Boeing or Lockheed, that same size. Raytheon builds nuclear submarines, uh, amongst many other things. Okay. So that's you can understand why they want to do this competition. NASA is not really a company, but they have a very large engineering workforce. So two NASA teams. Lynn? Who has to be the delivers to DARPA in addition? So, so you have a robot that does all of this. You demonstrate it, but what does DARPA get uh, in terms of the middle action So Professor Parker asked, what does DARPA get from this? The answer is absolutely nothing. They say that you keep your intellectual property. They don't expect you to give them the robot. So this is why I think a lot of people are excited about it. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the second talk then.